Hey, um, so uh, it's nice to be here again. And I, uh, I appreciate all of those that who bared with me uh, and joined on the last class today, uh, which will really uh, re finish off this uh, seven session series. Um, what we'll do today is actually, uh, for a minute, we'll go back quickly to the things that we saw at the end of last week. Um, and from there on, I am going to, uh, after we briefly see what we did last week, we'll move on and try to tie up. I mean, we're not studying Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're not studying um, Malachi, and we're not studying Daniel. I mean, we're not going to try to uh, finish all the books that we haven't seen. We've seen quite a few uh, prophetic literature, I think, throughout the series, and I'll try to to, I'll try to do my best to tie in a little bit, um, taking into consideration that it is Tisha B'Av on Sunday. So that's where we're heading. Let's look back briefly at this timeline, which I really hope that finishing this series, if there's something that you look back and you say, um, we've learned together, then um, it's 605 when the, net, when the Babylonians came about, it's uh, 597, when there was the Yoyachin exile, 586 BCE, when the first temple was destroyed, 538, when it was the Cyrus Declaration. We've gone through all those. I've repeated them time and again. And now the next dates, I'm hoping that you remember from the past two weeks or two or three weeks, are after 538, we discussed that there was some information we know from the first three chapters of the book of Ezra about what happened in those years um, when the first returnees came to Israel and they actually built an altar, but no table, uh, but no uh, temple. Uh, I'm repeating this time and again, because I'm hoping this is also giving you a context for when you next open these books uh, in the prophetic literature or in the Ketuvim, you'll be able to tell yourself, oh, okay, these are the first chapters in Nezah, they belong to 538. Oh, these are the first chapters of Haggai and Zechariah. They already describe a time that was about 15 years later uh, from the renewal of the construction of the Second Temple at 520. We discussed, I'll repeat it for, uh, uh, again briefly, um, that while they were building the temple, they were trying to figure out what is the status of this the Second Temple that they're building. And the way that... Um, that was demonstrated, among others, was by the question sent to the leadership, to the personnel, asking, should we stop fasting for the first fast, uh, for uh, the destruction of the first temple, when we build the second temple? Uh, and that happened right before they finished building the second temple. That was dated, according to Sefer Zechariah, at 518 BCE. Finally, the second temple was done in 516, now BCE. When the second temple was uh, finished being to be built, we know very little about what happened in the following years. I had briefly mentioned also the book of Daniel, which as I said, doesn't really give us a realistic historical picture, but it gives us another glimpse to the fact that while the second temple was being built and then built in Jerusalem, the Jews that chose to stay in Babylonia were, were uh, put in high, uh, I would say, uh, placement within the Persian palace. And they served as officials in the uh, Persian palace. That is obvious from the dialogue between Daniel and the Persian king, which is uh, a little confused name there, but uh, that's for studying the book of Daniel. But we also know from the dialogue in the book of Daniel that the Persian king actually respected their dietary laws and the fact that they had Jewish customs. So it's not only that Jews were high uh, professionals within the Persian empire, um, their ideology was also um, very well accepted and treated well. Another example, which I had also mentioned, is the Megillah of Esther. This is also not a series on Esther, and I'm not at all talking about the story or the plot. But I do want to talk about what we, what we learned from the historical context 
that Esther is located within. And since, as I mentioned, it, Esther is, uh, all takes place when the second temple in Jerusalem already exists. And from the lack of uh, any uh, conversation about among the Jews, about among Mordechai or Esther, about let's go to Jerusalem, let's pray, let's sacrifice sacrifices in Jerusalem. Maybe we should all go up to back and live in Israel. None of that takes place. Um, and that's even though this verse I assume everyone here is familiar with. Even though it takes place when they remember, well remember and recognize their, um, their uh, the fact that they were Jews and that they were exiled in, five, uh, in 597, 12 years before the first temple was destroyed. So to summarize that point that I wanted to make here is that when we look at the years, more or less, that the uh, we don't know exactly, but more or less that Hashverosh ruled and the Megillah took place. We're talking about approximately, you can see them here, the years between 486 and 465, 485 and 465 BCE. And we're talking about 100 years after the first temple was destroyed, as we all know, at 586 BC. And a few decades after the second temple was built. Um, there are two other uh, quick verses that I just want us to mention that really uh, give us a piece of historical information from the Megillah. I mentioned them by passing, I think, last time, and I just wanted us for a minute to look at the verses. The first one is, we'll see that in a minute why it's relevant. So we know it was in the days of Achashverosh. We know, as we just said, that he was. That they kept their Jewish identity and they remembered they were exiled from Yudah. But I wanted to also note the last verse. I'll translate it because there's, uh, I didn't pull up a translation here. The Megillah is well situated in current events. It's not only a story to look at uh, out of context. I mean, it's also a story to look at out of context. I'm not saying that that's not a valid reading. I'm saying that Vayasem HaMelech HaChashverosh, HaMelech HaChashverosh put taxes, mass, ala aretz ve'yayam, throughout. Bechol ma'aseu tokpo gvoton, everything he did, and all his successes, u'farashat gedulat Mordechai. And the fact that Mordechai became a high official within his, uh, I don't know how to be called exactly, but within his uh, temple roles or temple community, Asher Gidlo HaMelech, that the king recognized, Elohim Ketuvim Al Sefer Divrei Aimim Lemalchei Madayu Poras. The reason I'm mentioning this book is because of this. Elohim Ketuvim, they're all written on the books that, that, that dictate or that write up what had happened in the Persian Empire. When we read that pasuk uh, time and again, when we finish the Megillah, I know we all reach it kind of saying to ourselves, especially people like you who don't, or, or many of you who don't live in Jerusalem and are still asking for time to stay. I mean, I only have to do it. I, I come a day later since I live in Jerusalem. But uh, it's like a pasuk we kind of pass by and we say, okay, what's that so important? Or why, why is this such a dramatic ending for the uh, whole story of the Megillah? But what I want to note is against the backdrop of what we've been seeing, it really contextualizes extremely well and demonstrates how integrated the Jews were within the Persian Empire. If after such a huge story where all the Jews were almost killed and just because Esther was in the right place in the right time and Mordechai knew how to work around the regulations of the palace, uh, the final words are not, and now we will go to Jerusalem or now, from now and on, we understand that the temple should be in the midst or from now and on, we understand better off we would have we been if we would have 
be part of the returnees that came to Jerusalem. None of that is said in the Megillah. That's all my imaginary Zukim. What's said in the Megillah is that Mordechai was a high professional in the King of Hashverosh, and that many of the Jews, or most of the Jews, uh, appreciated his values, appreciated the way he was functioning. That is really a mirror of how bad the local temple was doing in Jerusalem. And that's why this pasuk uh, should be read really as what I would say uh, C or a D. I don't know how well you can grade in, uh, in, uh, in Hebrew. We would say nechshal, a fail here, uh, grade for the whole story at the end. Because the bottom line of the story is they learn to survive in diaspora and they learn to survive well and it does not have a bottom line of and then the Jews should come to Israel or and then the Jews should come to be worshipped in the temple or help in Israel. So with that in mind we have to go back to asking why did the Jews ask if uh, they should continue fasting? They asked if they could, should continue fasting because the Jews abroad just like we just saw from the last Pasuk of the Megillah, it didn't even occur to them to recognize this temple built in Jerusalem now as such a central occasion that uh, could be in any way a fulfillment of the first temple. And since it was not an, uh, such a central occasion, and since it was not seen as a fulfillment for the first temple, since it was so far from what was um, described in Solomon's temple, then the question was valid. Now we're going back to see what happened in the years that follow the building of this temple in Jerusalem. So we're looking now at the next psukim in the book of Ezra. We are not looking anymore at the psukim that are a retrospective description of the first years of the returnees. We are moving forward to the years after the temple was being built and situated already in Jerusalem. So bear with me, even though we read Ezra chapters one to three, and they were describing the years of 538 BCE, now we're reading chapter four of Ezra, which is a fast forward um, to 516, okay? And then we will move forward to the next chapters of Ezra and Nehemiah, that will take us forward another 30 or 40 years. So let's look what happened in Jerusalem. So people in uh, Yehuda and Benjamin that weren't exactly uh, happy about what's going on, uh, saw Jews that are building the temple in Jerusalem. And if we would translate this, and what we see is that these people that weren't happy about the returnees that are building, we'll talk about their identity in a minute, approached Zubavel and the high officers, and they said to them, let us build with you. Since we worship your God, we've been with your God. Ever since the time of King Asar Chadon of Ashur, he's the one who brought us here. So what do we learn now? There was a group of people that came to Israel before 722, before, um, before the 10 tribes were exiled, 722 BC. And why were they brought here? for the exact same reason that the 10 tribes were exiled uh, to different places in the Assyrian Empire. Because the way the Assyrian Empire controlled the mass lands that they conquered was by, ex uh, by making sure that, different, that the high officials, the capable officials of any country they reached and conquered were transferred to start a new life and a new beginning in a different land which was not their motherland country. And the minute they were transferred, if they had to, to spend all their energy just surviving, they were uh, safe from the fact that anyone would revolt against them or safe that from the fact that anyone 
would um, deny their uh, status as the main empire that controls all these countries. So imagine what we have here now. Let's pretend we're now in uh, the year of 516 BCE and the, the temple is being finally built and it's about to be finalized. And a group of people that have been here for, for from 722, if I'm taking the latest dates, the, the time that the 10 tribes were exiled, that means that they've been here for as many generations as generations that can um, be counted for 200 years, from 722 to 520 or 516, okay? They already speak the land of the country. They think they already pray to the God of the country. They feel like total local people here. And come a group of Jews that they've been exiled for 70 years now, and they come back to the land and they claim to say that they are the only people that deserve to build a temple here. So these people, they, that, and they barely speak Hebrew. And they're, they're, the language they prefer, as we can see soon from the text, is Aramaic. And the way they use names to call the months is exactly like in Babylonia. So these people that are now here for two generations at tops, or one generation, that have been living for the past 70 years in Babylonia, um, are approached by people that have been here for the past 200 years that feel totally like local people, and they are asked to build with them the temple. And these people, that their mother language is Aramaic, tell them, excuse me, we are the only people that are built here. You cannot join us. And this is their response. <laughs> Excuse me, we are two separate uh, nations. You cannot join us. So what if you've been here for 200 years? So what if you don't remember anything else? So what if you feel like uh, this is your land, not less than ours? Cyrus, who gave this his declaration and gave the credibility to build, gave it to us, those who were exiled from here 70 years ago. Um, now, these people weren't happy about this reply, and you can understand that their response was, And therefore, they did their best to, uh, to make this project for the building an impossible project and to make their lives miserable. And they did everything they could to get the best lawyers to make sure that they write letters to the palace to say that what they're doing is they're building in a way that's not legal. Now, I'll be honest, I wouldn't bring these verses that weren't important to me for the last uh, hour of our last class, unless uh, this coming verse was part of it. Because this coming verse really helps us the chronological of the Persian kings, which is extremely important, different from the way the rabbis, Hazal, uh, do the, the chronological order of the years. And look at this verse. It says, okay, they uh, hire uh, them out, or uh, I don't know, uh, help them uh, advisors thanks and what they say is call you may Koresh Melech Paras Ve'ad Malchut Daryavish Melech Paras so if we look at the chronological of the Persian we know today there was Cyrus then there was one king called Kanbuzi and he was the king in those exact years between 538 and 520 that the temple started to be rebuilt. He's not mentioned in the Tanakh, as I've been saying, because we don't know so much about what happened in those years in between. All we have is a retrospective description in Israel, the first chapters of the year 538 or 537. But then we don't know what happened until Daryavish's days, right? 
So Kanbuzi is not mentioned, and if I had to put him, I would put him in this word. Kol yamei kosh ve'ad malchut paras. This word ve'ad is really, uh, it, it includes the years of Kanbuzi. Ve'ad malchut daryavish melech paras. And who got Daryavish is exactly who, who we were talking about now. He was the one that in his days the second temple was finally built. Which comes next. So this is really the hint of Megillat Esther in the book of Ezra, because it says specifically in the region of Achashverosh, at the beginning of his region, they drew up an accusation against the inhabitants of Yehuda and Jerusalem. So from now on, if you want to try to make sense of the story and ask yourselves, why do I have such confidence that this actually happened when uh, this Megillat Esther actually happened when the second temple was already built? This is the reason, because this, these psukim at the beginning of chapter 4 of Islam give us the hint for the um, historical chronological order that fits with what we know from the documentation today. Now, what happened to Chazan? I just want to mention it in one sentence briefly. The reason Chazan have a totally different order, a different concept of what happened during the Persian Empire, which if you would look at all the uh, commentaries at all the Parashanim, you will see that they had assumed Achashverosh and Megillat Esther took place in the years before the temple was built, and that caused a lot of confusion, was for two reasons. First of all, they, in Seda Olam Rabbi and in the rabbinic literature, they didn't know there was a king called Kanbuzi. But now we understood why, because he's not mentioned in the Tanakh, and because nothing substantial happened in his days. And the second thing is that they weren't aware of the fact that there are true Daryavishes. The first Daryavish that was now in the days that the second temple was built, and the second Daryavish, which comes much later, we'll see him soon. So I'm not going into all the theological questions of how could it be that Chazal didn't have the information that we have today, or how is it that their perception of Megillat Esther and its historical context was so different from ours. That deserves a different treatment. But I will say that once we know the chronological order as it is agreed on today by historians of the ancient Near Eastern world, it fits perfectly with the psukim. The psukim give us and demonstrate very, very well exactly what we know. So now we know that the second temple was built and even after it was built, there were so many kings, uh, there were different kings and so many people that kept trying to, um, I would say, interrupt, first interrupt the building and then make the lives of their Jews difficult. Um, I do want to look at one Sukkot Malachi. I, oh, sorry, one second. And uh, I will go to Safaria for a minute. Malachi, uh, the chapter one. Malachi is, um, as you all know, or I don't know if you came across, is a very short uh, book. And the reason I didn't want to finish our series without looking at it is because we don't know exactly when to situate it, but we do very well know that he's considered to be the last prophet. Malachi is always said to be Achron Hanevi'im. I hope you can see it here. Masad Dvar Hashem El Yisrael Biyad Malachi. So no series would be uh, would have a full perspective if we don't look at Malachi. And it's amazing what we can learn from Malachi. The first thing that we see is that Am Yisrael was totally not confident that Hashem was really with them until the days of the last prophet. I've had here many times when someone needs reassurance time and again of God's love, of God's existing amongst them, it means that it's not obvious, even though such a build, building was built for, or a small building was built or for, uh, for a temple. Evan, and even though Cyrus Declaration took place and they came back to Jerusalem. And now you can see what they thought. So God tells them, I love you. And what do you respond to me? How will we know? 
So God responds. Hello, Achasav Yaakov, no, Mashem, Vahav et Yaakov. What do you mean? Well, you don't know what I'm talking about? There were two brothers, right? We had Avram, Yitzchak, and then there was Yaakov and Esav, and I chose Yaakov. And then God goes on to say, Ve'et Esav saneti, ve'asim et arav shma mavet, nachalato letanot midbar. Knows this what he says. I rejected Esav, and his hills are all desolation. There's, there's no... Uh, uh, reason for you to think that now we chose that now I chose Asa. Now I want to say something. The people who came back to Israel know very well, their attorneys, that they did not, as a nation, meet God's expectations to do a massive chazara b'tshuva, to, to re-keep the mitzvot. And you add that to all the reasons that we've been mentioning of why there was so, so much ambivalence during uh, the second temple period. The questions of when do 70 years pass, the questions of the rain and the dew, the questions that had to do with what does it mean that terrorist declaration was to all the nations, how hard it was to build here, the fact that many people didn't come back. And now we have, I want to add another factor that we didn't really talk about, but is also very significant. And that is the fact that it, there's nothing about people really returning to God in their action. Mm -hmm. So now what do they actually see? They actually see that there was an option on the table in these days. And it was a very uh, serious option in their eyes. The options went like this. There was Avram, there was Yitzchak, there was a chance given to Yaakov, we didn't work it out like we should have. We uh, didn't keep God's brief, God's covenant. And now Hashem decided he will fulfill his promise to Abraham and Yitzchak through Asa. And that's the story the Edomites were giving them. You can see it here. Itom al Edom, if Edom was saying, okay, now we, we have our opportunity now to build all our ruins. Notice how harsh this verse is. They are telling you that I have an alternative nation now? Well, I want to tell you that they can keep saying that. They'll build, and I'll destroy what they're building. Now, what's amazing is, for lack of time, I didn't bring the historical evidence, extra biblical evidence, but if we would check the Edomites in the 5th century BCE, we will see that they're actually expanding in the southern part of the country. And they're really succeeding. And we can see it from the tablets that were found um, in places like the city of Arad, today's Arad, but also then it was Arad, um, where the tablets say, here the Edomites are spreading around, the Edomites are succeeding, the Edomites are, sit are well situated in our cities, they might conquer us. And we can see that they actually had a very good time in Israel as far as their success um, in the fifth and fourth century BC. So the book of Malachi, even though I don't know exactly when it's situated, it well reflects the feeling of the people. And that's why God ends this conversation saying in Pasuk hey, and he's talking to the people of Israel. Look. One day you'll see that God will really be well recognized by Alec Yisrael. Meaning to say Hashem will really be there and will be recognized even though now during the time the second temple was built, that's not the case. But, and here comes the but. Now comes what God has to say about the way they're acting. Ben Yechabed Av, Be'eved Adonav, a son knows to respect his father. A slave knows to, to respect his master. And if I'm your father, <laughs> Now look what's really happening in the temple in these days. That's why these verses are also so important. First of all, they demonstrate what was the theological challenge for the Jews in Israel. And second of all, they demonstrate that even once a temple was built, there's a very hard, um, I would say, struggle 
among the people that want this temple to really be significant. Because look what the book of Malachi has to tell them about what's happening in the temple. Hakohanim, <laughs> the priests, Bozei Shmi. Bozei Shmi means to say that what they're actually doing is that they're uh, embarrassing my name. It's even more, Bozin is even more embarrassing. And you, not only that that's what you're doing, they're not, you're not acting properly. You're even asking me, what's the problem? What are we doing wrong? And I have to explain to you. You offer me on my altar sacrifices that shouldn't be there. And even then you ask me, what's the problem with holy sacrifice? And I have to explain to you. Because you guys are saying, you're looking around and you're not appreciating uh, and or recognizing this temple the way it should be. You think you can give me a blind sacrifice? It's fine. And you're giving me these sick animals and you think that that's fine. This is an amazing verse now. Then we'll move on from Mechalachi. Why is this so uh, amazing? Because you can see that Malachi is actually, I would say, in conflict with the Persian administration. Pecha is the word for the Persian official, what we would call in the past Nasi, or we would call uh, a different king, the, the top administrator in the lands that were conquered. During the Persian pe temple period, there is no king in Israel. I mentioned that. There's only the administrative roles. There, there are uh, priests, and there's the the Persian name for the administrative role, which is Pecha. And basically, what Malachi is saying is, you think that this should be uh, sacrificed in my temple? This should go to the local Persian administrative. Take it to your Pecha, not to me. And basically he's saying, even if you would take it to the governor, he wouldn't want it. Meaning what you're suggesting here is something that even a local governor would not want to see. So basically what we're saying is that the book of Malachi tells us um, in a very clear manner that we have a problem. We have a problem. It's a very significant problem because the Jews that are, um, that are situated in Jerusalem and are supposed to take care of the temple are not doing so. Um, now, I'll stop for a minute and pause and say that what we've seen till now, just to make sure everyone's with me on the same page, we've seen 538, the Declaration of Cyrus, we've seen what happened in the few years in the beginning of Israel, then we have a, a period that now we know is Kanbuzi, but which is not mentioned in the Bible. Then we have 520, 518, 516, which is finally when they rebuild the second temple, which is uh, described also in Haggai and also in Zechariah. And then we have a period of time which we saw in Nizra, which is the temple is built and people are constantly bothering them, uh, trying to figure out why they are not part of this Jewish community that's in Israel. And finally, what we saw in the book of Malachi is that the, king, the, the, the people on the one side still feel neglected by God, even though the temple exists. And the priests on the other side are not doing their job faithfully. And the way Nehemiah describes it, they're giving the temple something that would, they would never, never imagine. Uh, to give any even local uh, administrator such as a picha. Now I want to jump and fast forward to the book of Nehemiah. Um, I hope you can see it here. One second, why is this part here so big? Never mind, I'll move it down. Um, okay, here it is. Oh, this is not English. So now uh, let's talk for one minute about the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. And the book of Ezra, sorry, just up down, here we are. The book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra actually go, uh, are moving us ahead to about 465 BCE. It may be the case that the book of Malachi is just these days exactly, 
or just before or just after, because we don't have any historical indication. But, and we know that it's more or less the same time, it's under the Persian Empire when, when the temple was already built. Now, another big chronological question, which I'm not getting into, but just note that it's a big issue, is who came first, Israel and Nehemiah? And in what order did they come? In what years did they come? And in what way did they work together? Um, tradition has it that first was Ezra and then Nehemiah, um, the, the um, biblical scholars have different opinions, something that Nehemiah came and then Ezra came or that Nehemiah came and went back. Um, I'm leaving that all those questions in parentheses and just moving forward to the way Nehemiah describes the fact that he's coming. Um, and I'll start for one minute at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, which also connects us well to Megillat Estir. Vrei Nehemiah ben Chachalia, okay, the, this is the, the narrative of Nehemiah, son of Chachalia, in the month of Kislev. Notice the word Kislev here without any count of the Hebrew year, uh, the Hebrew name of the month, sorry, we would used to be saying the eighth month or something of the sort. And here we just have, or, or do both, like a bilingual, you know, also the name of the Babylonian month and also the number of the month as known in uh, Jewish countings of the month. And the fact that we only have Kislev here is an indication for the fact that he's really in Babylonia and we can see how local he is. You know, people always say that the language you count in is the language that you feel at home, and I mentioned it last week. So here is why I mentioned it, because you can see Nehemiah really is a Babylonian, and that's how he counts a month. So here is another um, roundabout mention of Megillat Estir, just to demonstrate again that Shushan was where the, the center of all the events. Um, and now we hear an amazing dialogue, and it's very important to see every single verse here, but we won't see all of it. I will do it briefly. And I, I recommend this as a, a learning for Kitabah. That one of my brother and Hashim came to Babylonia. They came to Shushan, to the Persian Empire. And now this is what I'm trying to demonstrate time and again. They kept their Jewish identity. They know exactly what nation they belong to, even though they've been staying for so long in Persia. I asked him about the Jews. Now look how he calls the Jews that are in Jerusalem. He doesn't call them the center, and he doesn't say that they're the main group of Jews. He calls them I asked them about the Jews, the remnant who survived from the, Jew, the Jerusalem temple being destroyed and about Jerusalem. So you can see he feels that the remnant are the people that live in Jerusalem. It's not as if, you know, if we argued and we discussed in the past classes, where is the center and where is the peripheria, who's the periphery here? So you can see it's not a question that's been resolved, not even now that the temple was built in Jerusalem. And here you can see again, they repeat, they replied, the survivors, who are the survivors? Those that live been living now for 80 years in Jerusalem, they're still called the survivors, even though they're the returnees that came from Babylonia to per or from Persia to Israel, who had survived the captivity there. And what do they say? We're in a, 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 a terrible stage. And the, the Jerusalem has no wall around it, and all the gates have been destroyed by fire. This is all after the temple was built. I heard this. I started crying. I had no idea. And I started mourning. And then I start, I fasted and I started davening in front of God. Now there's a verse, some of these verses we say in the 
davening, and we don't even know they're taken from Nehemiah. So um, I'm just going to say that next time you read these who came in the davening, you should know they're taken from Nehemiah. But and here he davens to Hashem. I'm moving fast forward, and he finishes his davening, and he says at the end of chapter one. Please, God, listen to my prayer. I really want to help this nation. And how can I do it? Help your servant, which is Nehemiah, I should be mercy. I should, I should have a merciful response. Haishaze is a Persian king. Why do I need mercy from him? I was in charge of everything that happened in the local palace. I was in charge. You know how you need someone who's, you can see it in uh, Putin's uh, way of uh, running his administration. The people he trusts most are the people who make sure he doesn't get poisoned, he makes sure and are in charge of those that he wouldn't be poisoned, right? That's like the current events example I can think of. So, that's exactly what he's saying. When he's saying, it's not just that he was offering drinks to the king, it's really he was in a high administration position and he saw to it that the Persian Empire's king stayed alive. Now he waits from Kislev till Nisan, maybe because it was winter and he wanted to come to Israel and you can't do this mileage when it's raining. We know again the Persian kings. Uh, okay, wine is in front of him. As usual, I made sure he's getting his wine and his food, and I was fine with him. And the king said to me, Why do you look so bad if you're not sick? So I see there's something that's frightening you, but I, I see it's something that's bothering you. But I was very frightened. So you see here this dialogue where we hear what Nehemiah tells the king and what's he feeling. What Nehemiah tells the king and what he's feeling. So here's what he tells the king. First of all, I respect you and I honor you and I'm, a, uh, I'm totally um, part of your uh, uh, personnel or officials and I'm, I'm worthy of trust. But you don't want to say Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city known to be a troublemaker. So he calls it Ha'ir Bet Kivrot Avotai, the city that's the graveyard of my ancestors. It's been all in ruins. Ushareya, you know, its gates and have all been uh, burned by fire. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern world, for a city to have a gate is a bit, the bare minimum of what a city needs to succeed. That everyone understands. So he's not talking about a temple, and he's not talking about Jerusalem. All those are buzzwords that can make the king feel extremely uncomfortable. What he's saying is something that the king can relate to. It's like saying my family's not well protected. That's all. There's some city somewhere over there, all in ruins. It doesn't have any gates. And I, I, you know, I fear, I fear of what's happening there when there's no gates. So the king asks me, So what do you want? Now look at, my, at the Nehemiah's response between us and him. He's telling us what he feels. Like, so I pray to God. And I said to the king, now we're back to the dialogue with the king. If you're, if it's okay with you, and if you found favor of me, again, no name of Jerusalem, but there's Yehuda, and I'll remind you again, I have issues with those city because it's where my ancestors were born. Let me build it. Again, no temple, no Jerusalem, just, I just want to build a gate around my city. Now look how cynical or sarcastic the verses are. Because what happens to the king? Okay, says the king. And by way of passing, he's telling us, And there's this woman sitting next to him. You can understand what Nehemiah is feeling and what he feels really interests the king between the wine that he poured at the beginning of the chapter 
and the woman sitting next to him now. And it's no coincidence that reminds us a little bit of the chapters of Achashverosh and Megillat Esther. It's the same Persian empire with the same setting. Okay, fine. How long will you be gone for? When do you plan to return? Then we don't see any more responses from the king. Apparently he accepted me. And he let me go. And I gave him time. But notice what Nehemiah does right away. And I think I read it fast because I feel that's the intuition it should be read in. Quickly, quickly, before he closes the door on me, I just, I know everything's extremely official. I've been hearing that they've been making trouble to the Jews. You remember the fourth chapter of Israel that we saw? It's very controversial. Do me a favor and give me some kind of papers that will be able to, uh, everyone will be able to recognize that what I'm doing, I'm doing it with your uh, permission. So I can go with them to Yehuda. He gives another, he wants another letter, this letter and that letter. And, and he was lucky. Look what it had, what we see it on the end of the eighth pasuk. So God was with me and Persian king gave me these letters. And that's how I came to Jerusalem. Now, since we read the beginning of Ezra, I just want us to see also the next pasuk, which is, There was, it was those people that, that we read about in Ezra that were bothered with the fact that the Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt or the temple is going to be rebuilt have now a problem with the fact that there's someone here fleeing out to build the temple, okay? Now you can see um, the way Nehemiah really feels about Jerusalem, because now if he thought it was coincidental, he didn't name the, the, he didn't use the name of Jerusalem before, now you can see it was, uh, it was uh, intentional, because now he says, now that he comes, he can name the name specifically. I came to Jerusalem and I was there for a while, for a few days. Vakum Laila, and then I woke up at night. And you know, I wanted to see what's going on. And I didn't have anything besides um, the animal that I was riding on. And this is just one pasuk that shows us how severe the situation was. It tells us that he went in Taladai and he tried to go around. And look at this pasuk, verse 14. Okay, I went through around the city. There was even no room here to be. This seems to be weird. Probably a horse or something. Or some kind of animal that I was riding. Under me to continue. So you can see how what he's, what he's describing here is how severe the situation was to the extent that even an animal couldn't pass. So, so we understand it was extremely severe. Now, I'll make the long story short because, um, you know, we can do a whole session on Nehemiah. So I'm not going to discuss that, what exactly happened, but I will say that what did happen was that Nehemiah succeeded in building um, a wall around the city, which turned out to be extremely substantial. And then we basically, and now I'm jumping a little bit fast forward to the Tanaic time. So we basically have a Jerusalem temple standing in Jerusalem, which we just saw how much help it needed to actually succeed. We don't know a lot about what happened next, but I want to say a quote of Mishnah because I think it's uh, a good way to understand what we've been learning within context. I'll show it a minute in translation. The next slide is translation. And this is a Mishnah in Masechet Menachot, and it tells us something very interesting. The, and I'm not talking about the halachic aspect of, about it. I just want to see one uh, comment. Why is this such an amazing Mishnah that I wanted to point out to, and why do I feel it's extremely substantial? The Mishnah says, one who says, that, and this has to do with what happens when you 
uh, swear that you're going to give a certain uh, korban. And the Mishnah says that if you promise you'll give it in the Jerusalem temple, and then you gave it in the temple of Chonio, Onias in Egypt, you didn't fulfill your obligation. But if in advance you said that you'll bring it to the temple of Chonio, but then you brought it to the temple in Jerusalem, then you may have fulfilled your obligation. There's a conversation here about in what way should we understand that his, fulfill, his uh, promise to bring a sacrifice was done. Now, what interests me here is not the question of whether he fulfilled his sacrifice properly. What interests me here is that we have to take one step forward and ask ourselves what happened in Jerusalem. Then what we learn from this Mishnah is that the rabbis see it as a legitimate option on the table that there's another temple functioning in Egypt in the times of the second temple. To the extent that they could debate when does the sacrifice uh, get legitimacy or when not. Now, this is one of two temples. There's also another temple in Yed, which I'm uh, not discussing now. But what it, these two temples demonstrate us, and especially the Mishnah's recognition of the existence of this temple, is that we had, if we had a doubt about the question of the centra centrality of the second temple, then the Mishnah actually teaches us a very important lesson. Teaches us that not only in Persia was it central, it's not a coincidental mistake that happened in Megillat Esther. It's not a coincidental a mistake that Nehemiah could sit and be such a high professional in the Persian of King's empire, come to Jerusalem and then go back because he promised the king and feel that he's fine. Even the Mishnah can, uh, could tell us that there was an existing temple in these years in Egypt, and that's also fine. Now, why is this so hard to accept? And why did we have such a, I would say, theological um, controversy around what uh, Nehemiah did? Uh, and here I want to go back to the book of Zechariah, uh, chapter 2. As by now, I hope you all remember. I'll uh, open it in fire for a minute. Um, as I hope you all by now remember, the book of Zechariah, talking about the days that, um, the days that are the building of the second temple. And in the visions of the book of Zechariah, what we can see very clearly is when I did share the screen, is this the expectation of the people. And the expectation of the people that comes across um, these visions is this. These are the visions of Zechariah. And now he's imagining what he would anticipate, what we expect, what he hopes for. Jerusalem will have so many people that it, it won't need any walls, it won't need any gates. Ve'ani, says God, I say, God, says God, will be the, its gate. I will be the one that will save the city. What do we see from the verses of Zechariah? That what really happened during the Second Temple period was a huge gap between what the people were hoping for and what they expected, and then what the reality brought with them. And I think the extreme example is the gap between um, this vision in Zechariah, where God will be a savior and the gate and the wall, and Nehemiah's understanding that if the people in the city want to survive, he has to quickly go to Jerusalem and make sure there's a wall around the city. Because no, because in, in normal life, or in Nehemiah's understanding of normal life, no city could survive if it doesn't have a wall around it. So. Basically, what we see here is, I would call it the Jews kind of making terms with the, uh, you know, if all, you say in English, if all else fails, lower your standards. So understanding that the second temple is not going to be built with, by God bringing it from heaven, like maybe can be understood from Ezekiel, 
and can will not be done without the people's participating, just like Chagai said. And I and I I can. Not, it's even more than that. It's understanding that the second temple there was basically almost um, no time at all that they had what we would call today not only religious autonomy but also national autonomy. And the only time that that happened in the uh, final years of the Second Temple was um, in the days of Hanukkah. So it's not coincidental at all that we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days and it's such a big deal. It's because what came about in Hanukkah, which was for the first time after the Bankabis revolt, that Jews had also religious autonomy, but also um, uh, were able to run their own country and didn't have this Persian empire imposing on every wall that has to be built and after reassuring every personnel that wants to come from Persia to Israel, that's really something that deserves celebration. Um, the next time we see such a, I would say such a, such events, and I'll share the screen for the final slide of this series, it's really here when the state of Israel uh, came to be. Can you see the slide? You can see them, here it is. Um, when, as, as I said, we have the independent Hashmonai state, 140 to 63 BCE. So now everyone, by now everyone's familiar with the years. We were somewhere, you know, at 5, 460 or 450 or 440 BC in the days of Israel and Chemia. It took another 300 years for the for there really to be independent. In 66 CE, the first temple was destroyed, and the next time we have independence is really when the state of Israel uh, was built. So I think it's a nice way to end the series and recognize the importance of. Uh, what actually happens when the state of Israel was built, but also understand that miracles never happened on such a large scale, meaning no temple ever came from heaven. It was never part of something that everyone agreed on. People lived in diaspora ever since they were in exile. And still we learn to recognize and appreciate the different opportunities God has given the Jewish nation. Um, on that note, I want to end. I will be glad to answer uh, questions for a few minutes, and I will look at the chat to see if there's anything else I can uh, answer. Yes. Um, I think I answered what's here. Okay, any other questions? So. So thank you all for being with me. Um, this thank was you. really uh, a very uh, nice uh, opportunity to meet from people from all around the world. Thank you so much. As always, amazing. I enjoyed and learned and kol akavod. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Always. So much. Thank you. The whole Thanks series was fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. We can't wait for you to come back. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. It's terrific. LA loves you. Thank, thank you very, you. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent. Well, Good night. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who participated and joined today. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next classes. Thank you. Thank thank you. everyone. And as our British friends say, well over the fast. <laughs> Thank you.